So hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And this is a four part webinar series <clears throat> and we're calling it Creating Great Places, the design series. Um, it's being put on by the QUT Design Lab, um, which Yvonne and I are part of, and then Urban Play, which is where Tobias is from. And so we'll all introduce ourselves in a second. Um, but yes, welcome everybody. And we're really excited about this. So at first, before we start, I want to acknowledge the Turbal and Yogara people, uh, the First Nations owners of the lands where QT now stands, and we pay respect to their elders, uh, lords, lores, customs, and creation spirits. And we recognize that these lands have always been places of uh, teaching, research, and learning. So I want to uh, respect that and pay our, pay our respects. So just briefly, our quick agenda for today, um, We'll do introductions and talk a little bit about the book that Yvonne and I wrote and how, how we got started on that. Uh, we'll talk about this idea of theory storming, this process. Then we'll go into six critical design theories that we also discuss in the book, but we feel like are, are key design theories that are used in multiple designs. Then um, we have four global priorities and each week we'll actually discuss a new global priority. So this week is salutogenic design and we'll talk about that. Then we'll use a multi-use trail scenario to describe how we can apply theory storming and salutogenic design. And then Tobias is actually gonna talk about creating great places in practice and using some of his examples from urban play. And then we'll have a discussion if people wanna stick around for um, questions or discussing how you can apply this in your own practice. So who we are. So I'm Deb Cushing. I'm the discipline leader for spatial design um, at QUT, which includes landscape architecture, architecture and interior architecture. And my background is actually landscape architecture. I did a little practice, um, both in design and in community planning. And my research really focuses on designing healthy child and youth friendly environments. Um, currently I'm working in you know, community parks, suburban parks, um, physical activity and different ways we can get people more active and more healthy in the environment. So, and then my colleague Yvonne. Hi, I'm Yvonne Miller. Um, I'm Professor of Design Psychology and Director of the QT Design Lab. My background's more psychology, so people and their use and interactions with places and spaces. And I really focus on how we can design age-friendly places and also create, I guess, exciting environments that encourage people to, to, to get active and to be outdoors more. And it's a whole lot of bioflick design, which we'll talk about. Great. Thanks, Yvonne. And Tobias will be introducing himself in a little bit um, although probably many of you know him. <laughs> um, so this is briefly uh, week one. This is our first of the series. So we're talking about theory storming and salutogenic design, as I mentioned. Then week two, uh, theory storming, child-friendly design. Week three is age-friendly and inclusive design. And then week four is sustainable design. So we have a, one, a global priority that we're covering each week. So this is actually how we start our book. Um, and this is, this is the book here. Um, so great places don't just happen, they are created. And what we mean by this is really that um, urban spaces, we have to think carefully about how we create a great place. And it doesn't just, um, you know, a lot of it is intuition, but in reality, we actually have to think carefully. We have to think about the theories that we know. We have to combine research and design, we have to really carefully think through who we're designing it for. Um, so a lot of consideration, a lot of thought have to go into creating a great place. So we wrote this book. Um, basically, when I first got to QT, I started teaching a unit called uh, People in Place or about how people interact with the environment. I actually had Tobias in to do lots of guest lectures, which always went over really well with the students. And I realized that a lot of the theory that we use in landscape architecture or design, environmental design um, come from lots of different, so like lots of different disciplines like psychology, sociology, geography, um, some from architecture, lots of different areas. And there wasn't any one book that had all the theories in it and actually explored how designers can use these theories really well. So I got together with Yvonne and we discussed this and her background in environmental psychology and mine in design actually really combined very nicely um, to look at all these theories. And together we came up with this idea of theory storming, which is how we apply it. So it's 
this idea that really we need to um, look in a more complex way. We need to be more holistic in how we design. And so it's using multiple theories in one way. Um, so that's how the book came about. Um, and we really did want to focus on health and well being because, as we'll talk about in a minute, um, it really it has a um, well, it's very critical right now, considering we're in, in this global pandemic and we're thinking about using space and how we can make our spaces more meaningful and how make, to make sure people have access to those spaces. Um, but realistically, it's about our health and well being, which has you know, to do with everything that our environment has. So one of the things, and um, you know, we've been partnering with Tobias and other practitioners. Um, so combining design and research. So this idea of evidence-based design, and there's this quote: "So a process for the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence from research and practice in making critical decisions." And it's really the the fact that we need to actually look at so what we know, so the evidence, and make sure those design decisions are based on those. So different professions like the medical profession, they already, this, they've already bought into evidence-based practice. Um, I think the design professions are still a little bit on the back foot in terms of making sure that we do use evidence and research to support what we're doing. So why is this important? So there's this, um, there's this great book called Welcome to Your World by Sarah Williams Goldhagen. And she has this quote, once finished, a new urban area or park or building will likely outlast every person who designed, engineered, and built it. And it will remain in use long after those who commissioned and paid for it are gone. Every element, building, landscape, urban area, infrastructure ought accordingly to be designed to help us thrive. And I think this is a really great quote in the sense that, um, you know, these spaces are going to outlive us. And we really need to think carefully about what we spend money on, how we create spaces that people can um, thrive in and use for long, long periods of time. So in the book, we came up with this idea of theory storming. And because we had six theories, six critical design theories, we thought, how can we actually use this idea, sort of like brainstorming, but it's really viewing a design problem through multiple theoretical lenses. And the goal is to generate evidence-based design solutions that are creative inspired. So we didn't want to do away with the creativity um, and just do it on, the, just base it on the science, but that, you know, the solution is effective and sustainable for multiple stakeholders. So it has multiple ways of thinking. So there's multiple users, but also the creativity and the evidence. So we were inspired by Edward de Bono's six thinking hats and that notion that you can think a different way if you put a different hat on. And so Edward de Bono argues, okay, when you're talking about a problem or a challenge, you can put on a different hat and think that way. So you put in the black hat of just the facts or the green hat of just creativity. And we wanted to do the same thing with theory. So put on a specific theory hat or a specific persona hat and, and sort of experience or think about the place through that lens. And so what we did actually late last year is that we tested that in practice with some colleagues from the Queensland Department of Housing, Homelessness and Sport. So they held a workshop where they came together, we talked about these theories with them, and then we set them a challenge to design a utopian place. And in that, they actually literally put on sort of a party hat, but it's of different theories and of different perspectives and of different priorities. So uh, put on a hat of biophilic design, a hat of playable design or sustainable design, or put on a perspective hat of being a homeless person or a younger person or uh, an older person. And through that lens, design a utopian place in this example. And here you can see some of the outcomes. It really is um, a fun way to engage with the design process and to force yourself to think through a different lens. And so Deb's now going to talk through some of the theories that we outlined. Thanks, Yvonne. So um, as I mentioned, we decided on six critical design theories. And obviously, there are many more that we use um, that all of you probably use and know about. Um, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about each of these um, in more detail this week because this is the first of the series. Um, and then the, the subsequent weeks will actually just remind you what these theories are um, and we'll go through them briefly. But um, today we'll, we'll discuss them in more detail. So I'll be talking about affordance theory, prospect refuge theory, um, and place attachment. And Yvonne is actually going to talk about personal space, sense of place, and biophilic design. All right, affordance theory. Um, and you can see South Bank, and I'll talk about this in, in a minute. But affordances are opportunities for actions supported by an environment, and they're com communicated through visual cues. So it's very much a design-oriented theory. They're also perceived by different users in different ways. So these cues are often determined by the surfaces, objects, and layout of the space. So they rely on not only how we perceive that cue, um, but also my, the individual characteristics of the person. So I use the example usually when I discuss this with students is a chair. So it's a very um, simple example. So a chair is designed in a certain way that it, I see it as an adult and I automatically know that I can sit in it. Um, depending on the materials, depending on um, kind of how the, the size or the, the height, I know that I can sit in it, but I could also probably use it as a step stool. So that's an affordance. That's an opportunity for an action. I could also hang my coat on it if it's, you know, if there's a, um, a solid or firm back. Um, but that depends on the material. So if it's a like a recliner chair, I might not be able to do that. So, but a child would actually see that chair and might perceive something different. So they might perceive other opportunities depending on the cues. So they might be able to climb under it. They might be able to use it as a table, things that as an adult, I probably wouldn't do. So that's what affordance theory is. It talks about those opportunities for actions and those cues that we design into a space. So here's an affordance for crossing a Sydney street in a, in a safe way. And the cue is actually just that little look left on the, uh, painted, on the, or page, uh, painted on the pavement. Um, so that's the cue to tell me which way to actually safely cross the street. So the affordance is actually crossing the street. Um, and then there's the cue there. So some of you, if you're, um, designers, uh, you probably are familiar with designer uh, desire lines. And this is a picture from Central Park in New York City. And it's an example of when an affordance is actually not provided. So, um, so basically, the steps going up this hill, they take you up to this point. And the affordance is the opportunity to actually get up to the top of this hill of a different level. Um, but what happens is people actually want to get over here. So they've actually just worn a pathway through. So this is where the affordance actually didn't quite match what people wanted to do. And so people have, you know, done their own thing. So we see this a lot, actually. But it's important to remember, so those cues um, are really critical to how people actually take up the actions. So the next theory is actually prospect refuge theory. And I think this is one of the more popular ones for designers to use, especially in landscape architecture, urban design, um, and there's a nice catchphrase because this is this was created by Jay Appleton uh, came up with a see without being seen phrase and it's this idea that actually we can see what's happening in our environment without being seen or at least being protected so we have refuge in some way so this is an example of um, a viewing platform at the High Line in New York City again and um, if you're sitting here in so this amphitheater area, you actually have a view out onto the street down below, but you're protected because you're up high, so you're not in the line of traffic. Um, this actually goes back to sort of when we were hunter gatherers in some sense, and so we actually needed to see what was happening so we could actually understand where um, kind of the prey might be, where we might need to actually do some hunting, um, but we would be protected so we wouldn't be eating ourselves. Um, Obviously, this has other implications in the urban environment, but um, so this is the idea. And it could be protection. It doesn't have to be protection from danger. It could actually be protection from um, weather, inclement weather. And I'll show an example of that. So prospect refuge, just to recap, is, is it describes the idea that people in public places feel most comfortable when they can observe what is happening around them while also being slightly protected. 
Um, and you'll notice like people actually like to sit around the edges of public spaces and that's because of prospect refuge. So this is actually um, something that makes us feel more comfortable when we have both of those. Another example from New York is this Paley Park, which is a, a pocket park, um, very popular. Um, so it pr provides a secure space of refuge, um, but a view looking back into the street. So where I'm taking the photo from is actually the street. And so I'm looking in, so if people are sitting in here, they actually can view out um, onto the street and have a, a, a view. So they have prospect, but they also have a refuge. Now you can also think about it in small micro uh, scenarios where if they're sitting here along, um, this is like a seating wall. So they might have refuge here because their back is against the wall and actually could view the, the park. So you can look at it at different scales. And this is the Salk Institute in, in California, and it's known specifically for the prospect that it provides and the, the different vantage points. Um, so again, if you're standing here, you might have refuge. If you're out in the middle, you actually don't have both. You might have prospect, but you don't have refuge. If you're standing here, potentially along the edge of the building, again, you might have both of those prospect refuge. So it's important to think about it in both ways where of space that you actually have both prospect and refuge. And then finally, place attachment. Um, so place attachment actually explains why people develop emotional bonds with specific places, often treasured landscapes from their childhood because we have emotional attachments to people and the activities that we do. So using that knowledge during the design process can aid in the creation of better places that people will use and enjoy, take ownership of, and thrive in. And there's research to say if people have place attachment, they're more likely to care for an environment or to um, do action to protect it. So those we do actually want people to develop attachments to place. So one example in different urban situations is ethnic enclaves, especially in large cities where actually there's Little Italy, Little Havana, Chinatown, places like that. So um, people have deep attachments to places that they came from, their origins. And so they actually bring um, cultural symbols and things like that, practices, and they actually bring it to where they are now. And it shows that deep attachment to other places. Another example is, um, and research shows that people develop attachments to places when they actually can change them or they can participate in decision making or can, they can have some say in what something looks like. So this, these are examples of International Parking Day, which you may all be familiar with, where people can actually take over a parking spot and make it into a small parklet. So again, people develop attachments to that singular space because they've actually created it themselves. Now I'm going to hand over to Yvonne, who's going to talk about a few other theories. So I'm going to start with personal space theory. Um, and I, it's funny, you know, with COVID-19, I'm pretty sure we're all much more aware of personal space than we ever have been ever before. So personal space theory, also known as proxemics, uh, next slide, Deb, um, the physical space surrounding their body. It's the language of space and it's a need to keep a certain physical distance from others. Each of us carries an invisible personal space bubble around us, and this helps us negotiate space. And this instinctive kind of invisible protective zone explains why we tend to feel uncomfortable uh, when strangers sit next to us, you know, on an airplane or public transportation, and why we tend to sit closer to good friends than, say, our boss. And our personal space boundaries really differ according to culture, personality, and gender. And Edward Hall, many years ago now, was the first to talk about how we manage this. And in this, um, in this slide here in this graphic you can see kind of the domains or the zones of personal space from intimate distance and personal distance so we can be close you know with our friends and our family and our children and loved ones and then social distance and we also the bottom graphic shows how we protect our personal space if we're a man and whole man spreading things sometimes and she bagging so that's a woman using her handbags to steal a little bit extra space on public transports or on seats and next slide uh, so here you see some photographs uh, of seats, outdoor seats. So there's some in snowy Helsinki. You can see they kind of uh, space apart a little bit to give people a bit more personal space. We've got a round uh, outdoor seating in Hong Kong that people 
ability to sit where they want a bit apart and not look straight at each other. So again, maintaining some personal space boundaries from, from strangers. And in the bottom example is actually from the United Kingdom. It's called the Friendly Bench. And they've just started sort of popping up all over the place. And they're designed for people to, if you want to actually have a conversation with somebody, you actually go sit there. There's some uh, vegetation sort of behind you to give you that little bit of refuge. Um, and it's just a space to tell people, hey, yeah, come sit here on these seats and have a conversation. Yep, next slide. Ooh, we've got some tech problems a bit slow. Here we are. Ah, oh, sense of place, genius loci. This is probably almost my favorite uh, theory is it really taps into what our indigenous elders tell us about our connection to place and our connection to land. So genius loci is Latin for the spirit of the place and too often actually design practice is criticized for being cookie cutter, cookie cutter or generic or placeless, disconnected from its site and its context and its neighborhood. In contrast, when we embrace sort of sense of place or genius loci, then there's a real genuine connection and dialogue with the unique spirit of the place. Um, and we see that in its distinct history, its environment, its climate, its topography, traditions and cultures. And we actually see this in this picture. So this is from, uh, it's the Zalog Bridge in the Netherlands from Next Architects. It's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful, a wonderful design. So you can see when the river floods, the, the stepping stones become uh, like a bridge that people can walk across. But when the river's not flooded, they are just, just a seating place. Next. And a really well-known example is, uh, where are we? Oh, I talked through that, sorry, next step. Uh, a really, really well-known example is Gasworks uh, Park in Seattle, where Richard Haig actually decided to keep uh, these kind of industrial remnants and, and celebrate uh, their heritage and made it a feature of a site rather than hiding it away. Next. And so we have also in this next slide, some images of, I guess, different aspects that, have, that different designs that have respond differently Loci, the unique sense of place. In the middle, a photo Deb took of, of the Gold Coast of some uh, surfboard seats. At the top is Oslo's uh, Opera House. Uh, it's like a glacier coming out of and connected to uh, the water around. And the bottom is actually that um, the same picture as we saw before of the Zalog Bridge, but this time when it's not flooded. So you can see that what 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 is stepping stones, you know, during a flood is actually just seats and, and markers at the rest of the year. Next. Just waiting for my next theory to come up, which is biophilic design theory, quite possibly my favorite theory. So of course I've got a picture here of Singapore, which has got a really um, it's very much committed to being a garden in a city, uh, so or a city in a garden. Uh, so biophilia acknowledges that we as humans have evolved with a really close connection with nature, and we do better when we're connected with nature. It's really only the last couple hundred years uh, that we've become disconnected from nature, and as hunter gatherers, we grew up and you know we've evolved from being really closely connected to the passing of seasons and to grass and to the wind and the weather and all of that. And there's a large body of research that shows that the more you have to do with um, the more you have to interact with nature, the better you are. Uh, so there's, uh, next. So we have this deep seated connection you, to be connected with nature. And you can see some examples here, uh, Singapore, but also uh, biophilic urban renewal and downtown Seoul, where they turned what was previously a highway into a wonderful stream and place. And there's a number of great studies that show benefit of biophilia or connection to nature, little things from, actually not even a little thing actually, we know that the more trees there are, the less crime there is. Um, and if you're exposed to greenery and trees and you walk around a little bit, you're actually, the neural pathways in your, in your, in your brain that are linked to depression are reduced. So there's a lot of great data that shows the benefits of green spaces. And so we really need to embrace and to advocate for much more environments and designs that link us to you know, outdoors and to nature and to animals. Next. Typical for a university of technology, we've got really <laughs> technology is slow, hey Deb. Um, oh, here's, of course, um, some of the most uh, well-known uh, designs 
are you know inherently biophilic so we've got falling water uh, and at the bottom most recently Bosco Vitale and in Italy which actually is a new building uh, that is was the world's tallest or the best tall building in the world in 2015 and for every person living in the building there are two trees 10 shrubs and 40 plants and it's really um, shown how often the best practice now of contemporary architecture is radically biophilic um, and in, and if we can engage in this sort of immersive sensory approach, that's the way to really design one to be great places. Thanks, Yvonne. Sorry, I, I'm changing them as fast as I can. I don't know. Is it um, delayed for everybody, the slides? Well, you probably don't know. <laughs> um, just bear with us, I guess. Um, so now I'm going to talk about theory storming and salutogenic design, and I'll explain ex actually what salutogenic design is, because um, not only is it actually hard to say, it's um, a complex idea. Um, sorry. Let's see. So basically, salutogenic design actively promotes health and well-being using a systems thinking approach. So addressing all factors that create, enhance, and improve physical, mental, and social well-being. So that systems thinking approach is really important. It, it looks at all the inputs and outputs. It looks at how we're related to different things in our environment, different actions that we take. You know, and it takes, um, it looks at the human as a holistic being. So it's not just about physical health. It's not just, you know, whether we get enough exercise. It's also about our mental health, how stressed we are, um, you know, how we breathe, eat, everything um, is all related. Also, social well-being is important as well. So those social networks, those um, social capital that we have. So those are the support systems that we have. So if something goes wrong, we can actually, we can be more resilient. So it all comes to play in salutogenic design. The actual word translates to uh, health origins. So saluto being health and genetic or genetics or gen genesis um, being origin. And so it really is the idea that um, it's health promoting. So it's taking a proactive approach. So it's important not to think of it as the opposite necessarily of pathogenic where disease causing um, but that we actually need to have both in um, how we look at the environment. So we need to address the disease that's already there. Um, and we need to, you know, the medical approach is still quite important. Um, but we also need to have the proactive approach and look at how our environment is impacting our health and well being from the start before we actually have those diseases or problems. So what is health? So the World Health Organization, I often um, kind of remind myself of this definition. So they define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And I think that's really important in the sense that, um, and I'll show a slide in a minute, where it's actually more holistic than just not being sick, right? So that doesn't mean you're necessarily healthy. And I think when we think about the environment, we have to think, you know, spaces that don't make us sick are not necessarily health promoting either. So it's not good enough just to, to be neutral. We actually can't, we have to be health promoting now. So our global health crisis, um, you know, we're all familiar with this. Obesity, heart disease, mental illness is a big one now. Um, fatigue, stress, those things that we might not necessarily even go to a doctor for. Um, we're dealing with those injuries that we have. Um, now, obviously, we have COVID-19 that we're dealing with. So, you know, we're in this global health crisis, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon. So these issues affect all ages, they affect all abilities, they affect their, and they're impacted by our environment. And we can actually address them with how we design the environment. And that's the whole basis for des salutogenic design, is we can address some of these things by designing better places. So here's just one example. So three quarters of UK children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates, which is a little bit shocking. 
Um, but if you've all gone through homeschooling and kind of everybody's addicted to the screen right at the moment, um, it, it actually is not surprising in some sense. Um, so how can we do this better? So it's not just a matter of making kids go outside. It's designing places that are conducive to being outside, that are safe, they're healthy, um, they're exciting, they're places people actually want to be. Um, so it's, it's actually looking at it more holistically. So I think, you know, this idea that doctors actually prescribe um, green prescriptions now um, to get people outside to be active. And that's really critical and important, but we really need to design the environments that enable those things to happen. So thinking about the affordances, thinking about other factors that how can we make sure our environment enables these things to happen. So um, a medical psych sociologist, Aaron Antonofsky, actually came up with this idea of salubgenesis, and he bases it on the sense of coherence construct. And it really has three things in it. And so it describes the ability for people to confront a source of stress with motivation to cope with it. So something that's meaningful to them. The belief that they understand it so they can comprehend what's happening and they can, um, they can figure out what to do. And then also the resources to deal with it. So it's a manageable source of stress. And I highlight here resources because I think what we need to do now is not necessarily focus on how the person has internal resources, but how our environment actually provides resources that, to support um, how a person actually can behave and what they can do in their environment. So it, it's really about the environment that we need to focus on, um, especially today. And then I, I, I like to think that um, it's not just about, you know, clean air, clean water, making sure, you know, we get act, um, enough physical activity, although those things are extremely important. It's also about the emotion and the feeling and how we um, interact with our spaces. And so designing places that make us feel good, happy, calm, energized, inspired, playful, and healthy overall. And those are all really important to think about as we design great spaces. So there's a, um, I think if we think about boring places, those aren't necessarily, we don't necessarily think of them as unhealthy, but they really are. And there's a, a term we, we talk about in the book um, called going postal. And it's kind of this, funny little term, but it, you know, if you think about how post office have been designed, at least this is in the US, boring, institutional, gray, no color, um, you're doing a monotonous job where you're doing the same thing over and over. And actually the idea is that people then um, get angry and they get violent and then they have outbursts. And I think the same thing we can think about in our environments. If we're designing places that are just boring, they're uninspiring, they don't calm us down, but they don't energize us, they don't do anything for us. I think that that's not good for our health. And so we have to rethink that. So, and that's actually what the focus of placemaking a lot of times is, is making sure that spaces are designed in sort of this um, really great way to inspire some of these feelings here. So um, we're going to focus on a multi-use trail and we're going to take this theory storming approach. I'm going to apply this table um, that we have um, that we've used and all the different theories in it. And the reason we've chosen a multi-use trail is that is a very, um, we think of that as being a very healthy environmental facility um, or infrastructure where, um, and it doesn't have to be a long trail system or anything. It could be a sidewalk. It could be um, you know, a pathway, but multi-use in the sense of different, um, different activities can happen on it. So biking, scooting, um, you can push a wheelchair, you can walk, you can run, different kinds of things. So we'll go through that. So here's the table. Um, this is sort of the theory storming approach is that you would actually take each of these six theories. And again, as I mentioned, there's other theories. So you might put different theories in here. Or you might swap out some. And that you can look at actually how it would um, result in a different design solution. So I won't go through all of them in, in the sense of time. But we can think about affordance theory. So that's about the opportunities for action and the visual cues or the cues that we have based on, that we notice based on our personal characteristics. So you think about clear signage um, so we can find our way or 
having a appropriate width or surface material so that we know which activities we can actually do on the trail. So obviously if you have a gravel or dirt pathway, it might not be conducive to certain activities. Um, things like rest stops. So somebody who um, may have a mobility issue or may be older, um, they might not be able to go as far. So they might see, you know, oh, there's, there's no rest stops you know, every certain distance and they not, might not feel that they could actually do that activity in that um, space. Lighting for night use, I think um, research shows that females are less likely to use spaces if they're not lit at night. So again, it's, it's taking the personal characteristics, but also um, the cues to do different activities in that space. And again, not to go through them all, but you might look at, um, you know, sense of place, you might look at presence of local art, cultural symbols. Uh, an easy one is using regional materials, um, regional plant materials so that you can actually understand where you are in the world and it doesn't look like it's just any place, it could be anywhere, um, or celebrating local character. And then something like biophilia where, um, you know, we might think, oh yes, you know, if you're, you have a multi-use trail outside, of course you have access to nature, but not always. And I'll, I'll show one example where you don't, um, so it's, it's thinking through all these theories and what you can do, how they can actually inform a better design. So this is a space I think probably most of us are, are familiar with um, in Brisbane, so South Bank. Um, and you know, this is not necessarily, some people don't think of this as a trail, but just the pathway that's going through. And obviously South Bank is much bigger than just the pathway. But what I did was um, I looked at all those theories and kind of figured out if they actually apply to this, the design of this space. So we look at affordances. So you have ferry stops, um, which affords access getting there. You have a wide pathway, which affords multiple people using it at the same time. You have um, the um, pathway material, which is a hard surface. So um, it's good for biking and walking, or this gentleman's in a, a wheelchair, this woman is um, on a scooter, so it affords, you know, different activities. So you definitely, definitely have affordance theory in here. Um, prospect refuge theory, this is interesting because, um, so basically you have people sitting along this wall here, um, if you can see that. Um, so they have refuge because they're protected not only under the tree canopy, but with their back against sort of vegetation or a planting bed. So they feel protected in some way, they have refuge, but they also have a view of the trail or of the river. So they have the prospect. And it's interesting to note that this is just a, a lovely seating wall as well. And in another context, it might be full of people um, because here you might, you have prospect. So you, ha you could sit here and have a view of you know, the walkway, the pathway but you don't necessarily have refuge here. So you have no protection under the tree canopy. Um, if you're sitting facing the pathway, your back is to the water, so you could easily fall in or you know, there's boats going behind you, you can't tell. So again, that's where prospect refuge, it's important to have both. Personal space, we have, it's, it's plenty wide enough for people to pass each other, to have both people walking and biking. So I think there's uh, personal space has been addressed. Place attachment, Again, that's sort of some of those experiences that people tend to um, have and it creates attachments to places. So you have people having a family picnic or a gathering. So there's definitely opportunities to de develop attachments to this place. And then finally, biophilic design. So obviously lots of vegetation. There's lots of wildlife in here. Um, the river. So you have different um, kind of access to nature and it's celebrating nature. It's not just in the in the background. It's actually using nature as part of the design. So this is an example where um, it's actually been, um, you know, even if theory storming wasn't done with the design of that, um, it actually applies, a lot of the different theories apply to a well-designed space. So then we contrast it with, um, this is the bikeway on um, the Western Freeway. Um, I actually took this picture yesterday on my bike ride home. Um, so it's kind of gray as it was yesterday. <laughs> uh, and basically, it's a completely different story, right? It's obviously a different context, so you wouldn't expect the design to be the same. 
and it's not necessarily a multi-use pathway. It's um, just usually for bikes and it's usually for commuters. I will say it's, I call it the commuter um, highway, super highway, biking super highway. And um, so if we just apply that same theory storming approach, we look at, okay, so personal space, yes, it's wide enough. Usually there's not too many issues. It's not too much um, crowding on the pathway. We can pass each other. Affordances, yes, but it's very limited. So, um, you know, there's really only one use. So, and it's, it's usually, I wouldn't say high speed, but you know, there's people going fast along. So every time I see a child who's kind of struggling on this pathway with their parents, um, just learning how to ride a bike, um, I sometimes cringe because I think, oh, I hope, yeah, I hope there's no issues. But again, affordances are limited. Uh, we have prospect refuge theory, I think, Maybe if you could that sense that you know you're protected up here. This is a raised pathway, and then you actually get a view out onto the the freeway. Maybe a view onto this is Mount Kutha here. Um, but again, it's not it's not anything celebrated, and it's very limited. But then if you think about sense of place, this could be anywhere at all. Like the, there's no design qualities that tell me this is in Brisbane. Um, place attachment. Um, there's nothing that actually would would sort of other than the fact that I use it daily and that's that is one thing that helps develop place attachment. Um, I don't think there's anything that would get people attached to this place and then biophilic design again, you might have a view of Mount Kutha, but really it's not celebrated. Um, I mean, sometimes a flock of um, cockatoos might come down so that there's nature around you, but really um, this looks pretty bland and um, yeah, I'm very thankful it's there, but I think it could be designed better. Um, so that's, a, again, an example of how we would use theory storming and how we would use these theories to really inform designing better places. Um, and so just a teaser here, um, Yvonne and I are actually working on our next book called uh, Redesigning the Unremarkable. And it's actually to look at places like this. So if anyone has any photos, um, please contact us of um, places that actually need to be redesigned because we're going to kind of um, look at how theory can inform better designs. All right, so now I've talked enough. Um, so I am going to hand it over to Tobias, who's going to talk about creating great places in practice. And he's going to give us some great examples. So I will hand it over to him. So I will stop sharing, Tobias. And awesome. Let you share your screen. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Yvonne. So great to be part of this um, webinar series. And let's just see how this works. And yeah, really excited to be part of this. And that was fantastic. I still remember when you gave me the book, Deb. And I have to say, there's a lot of like, I guess, theory books out there. But to actually take this book home and read it in one afternoon, it got really inspired and it's so practical use as well. So just a great reminder of what we are doing as a landscape architect every day, but then how we can reflect on the designs that we have done and then how we can communicate it back to our clients as well and really give some evidence behind it and what the thought processes were. So I think before I go into showing one of our examples of creating a great place, I just give a little introduction who I am and who I work for. So most of you, are, a lot of you maybe know me, but yeah, I'm Tobias Volbert. As you can hear, I'm not an Aussie. Still try to say she be a right mate, but I'm um, struggling. But I'm a landscape architect from Germany. Came 13 years ago for a holiday, never left. I'm really passionate about sustainability, permaculture, and I guess really creating healthy designs. My wife is an occupational therapist, so she always challenged me on this idea of inclusive design and healthy design. That's why I started in 2013, the Seven Senses Foundation, really to provoke thoughts about inclusive design that goes beyond accessibility, beyond just designing spaces that are accessible for wheelchair, but not looking at all the challenges you mentioned before there as well, Deb, about sensory processing disorder, mental health, etc. cetera. And um, now I work for Urban Play. So Urban Play mission is again to build playgrounds that are destinations, the lifeblood of the park. It's really about, as you said as well, when we design salutogenic places and, and play environments, they need to be a destination. They need to actually capture the imagination. They need to have 
cues that actually make you, I want to be active in here and I want to connect with other people within the space and I want to stay longer. And I think the other thing we're doing at the moment with QUT is this research on intergenerational playgrounds. And again, it shows like the more people we can capture in the space, the more vibe we create and the more healthy activities actually happen in that space. So that's what we are really passionate about at Urban Play. So we are a design and construct company that um, do play environments. We do everything from the play equipment to the shade to the rubber, et cetera. So pretty excited and doing a lot of like bespoke elements that are fully, truly playable as well. So the thing about salutogenic design, which I found really, really inspiring, and that's a great term that, as you said, by Aaron Antonovsky in my birth year, 1979, uh, was formed. And I think it's this whole idea, the seven senses was one thing. And then, yeah, we have the green streets movement, we have horticulture theory, we have biophilic design, urban forestry. There's a lot of amazing things, but they all happen in isolation. So as you mentioned, like salutogenic design is really about a system thinking approach, how all of these different thought provocations and, and theories all need to be combined. And that's why we need collaborations to create great places. It can't be just we as a landscape architect. So we really need to partner up with more of the, the, the um, health professionals. I predicted that in 2013, I thought by now, a lot of the bigger firms would have occupation therapists, psychologists within their businesses. It's still not happening, but we're getting better and better. And I think that's really the key thing. The more people we get involved, the more ownership and the better designs we can, we can apply to this space. So as some of the facts you mentioned about like the increase, like one in a hundred kids have now autism, one in 20 sensory processing disorder, 27% um, of Australian mental health issues, Obesity is another massive one. 41% of children daily intake comes from junk food. So when we look again, how do we create salutogenic parks that actually allow for healthy food deliveries as well? So a lot of more parks now have areas where food vendors can come in. And I think that would be another great thing for council to support to actually get healthy food vendors to come to parks so that they're not going to McDonald's. McDonald's put a vision statement out that they want to be within 500 meters of every resident. So that's a scary thing. So how can we contra design that and actually design destinations that allow for healthy food as well while we are in the parks. And obviously screen time is a massive thing as well. And even though when the kids are out, they're in these parks. That's why I think that the creation of destinations is important because the research that we did again with you guys on intergenerational parks showed that parents normally stay in a park as long as they have read their emails and then they're going. So who do, how do we make the parks more intergenerational and, and inclusive for all to be active in that park to stay longer so they spend more time and be more engaged so, as you said, with the design theory storming, you use the hats. I'm a big coffee drinker. So when I read the book, I got back into the office and um, draw up like a little coffee cup and say like all these different smells come out of the coffee. So now this poster is actually in front of every single person working at Urban Play. And after every design that we are doing, we sit together, drink a cup of coffee, we reflect on what we actually have designed, and then we look at each of the theories. Look, did we really look at the sense of place. What is the narrative? What is the story we really want to tell? And did we get something from the client? What questions do we have to ask the client again to really get to that narrative? The place attachment theory, biophilic personal space, prospect refuge, and affordance theory. So now I thought I use this on, on a park that was um, the Tucker Family Park and just explain how these theories can be applied to that park that was designed a couple of years back. So this is the Tucker Family Park in um, Brentwood. It um, was a partnership between the Avid Group, um, ACOM from the Sunshine Coast, Jason Daly was a main LA on, on this project, then Ipswich City Council and us as Urban Play. So the Tucker Family Park, so the name alone, it's the Tucker family that actually owned the, the big dairy farm there. So it was really an acknowledgement to this family um, to, to call that park after their name. So it really blended in with a sense of place, with a place attachment as well. And um, it's a really challenging site. So as you can see, the topography is um, pretty, pretty hard to work with. There's a lot of existing vegetation. And in 99% of developments, you see actually that they actually would clear it. 
and then have like level side and then we have play equipment and and i guess um community spaces within a very artificial world so here um we worked with the existing landscape we left a lot of this canopy and really nestled the play in between it so as i said the taka family that was really the sense of place really connecting to that community the place attachment there was so much community engagement early in the piece as well so for example there was like a, a group um to boot, boot camp um operation um, that were really interested to utilize the park for boot camps so they were incorporated in the design then um there's a very active Facebook community as well that is still coordinated by the Avid group and there's a dog park incorporated within this park as well and the feedback after a couple of years was or after a year was like that the dog park a lot of big dogs and small dogs and they didn't get along so again the and then the, the group changed it so now we have a small dog park for smaller um, dog owners on the other side as well so the park is evolving really takes a lot of ownership there's zero vandalism and the community really loves it. it really brought the community together and it became a destination even though it was under the planning scheme from ipswich city council a local park so with a local park there's a lot of challenges again so we can't have barbecues in there there's no toilet facilities but because we were a little bit creative how we work with the planning scheme we put two pocket parks together to really create something spectacular within that i guess um planning challenge that, that we had to work with so then when we look at the fourth theory that is my favorite i think every design we do as well i look at every single object that we place into a playground to make sure it has more than the one four and as you said with a, um, a chair for example that but it could be like a sandstone sandstone boulder so it becomes a seating element but i can climb over it i can jump on it i can sit under the canopy on it i can sit with two people over it so every single element that we do we need to have multiple affordances when we look at a macro scale so that's what we do again to explain the design methodology on this one here so the big green space in regards to play zones is the play zone on the upper level and then we have a big um, um sports hub at the lower lower area of the park and then we have a senior play and a junior play and then we have a lot of different connectivities through the space here's a bit of a render that shows you the idea of a fitness community hub at the bottom so again that was inspired and and i guess um collaboratively designed with a boot camp operators to really get a lot of use of it and then a huge shelter area that can be used by the community to be part of this but also this mover so it's like a sports field where you can play basketball um, inline hockey you can play soccer so it has so many affordances and then a big oval as well to play your footy get inspired to that and then it's all connected to the playground that is nestled within the tree and playing in the canopy so the other thing is then with the affordances theory as well we always do a seven senses and a play variations overlay for our designs so again at a macro scale so that the best park designs i believe are the ones that provide choices for all so it's about designing zones or play rooms so in in old times a lot of time especially with local parks it was like one concrete curving and then we have the swing set a play unit everything in one space so if i come there with anxiety issues and and i look at this play space and it's busy with people i will never go there so it's not a place for me where i can find this prospect refuge where i can be safe but still be engaged with the space so in here it was a zone of of swinging so you can be in in the middle of the trees just by yourself or with a mate and just experience your know, vestibular stimulation and just look into the trees and just get inspired through here and there is like a thrilling and climbing and sliding zone with a big tower that is a visual thing as well for the community come here there's something exciting it provides you with thrill and 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 um a, a challenge and then it actually steps down to the more um, junior play with a play hat that has a double of um one area as well with a double slide which i think again is a non-negotiable needs to be in a park because a lot of kids with sensory processing disorders when they actually go onto a platform and they think about oh can i slide down or not they sometimes need longer so then another child could come and go like come on joey go down why are you not sliding down and then they will never come back because they get intimidated so if you have a 
a double one. Somebody can grab you by the hand, come down with you or pass you by. So it just provides another safer space to engage in the zone. And then a spin zone, a bouncing zone, and then again, more fitness engaging space. When we then look at this micro scale, as I mentioned, to look at every single element that was used within this park, does it have multiple affordances? For example, here the sandstone boulder that is actually part of what we did here, it's a nine meter high tower, and then we did a minus two meter negative slide. So it's an 18 meter slide coming down an embankment. So rather than rubberizing the entire embankment, we actually use just mulch, and it's a bit of a, a nature play experience in between the two spaces. And this boulder, for example, has the forces that it holds uh, erosion, so it's an erosion control. It also provides um, seating opportunity, balancing, jumping, sitting on it, hanging out with two people, taking a stick and carving in it. That's why I love sandstone boulders as well as informal seatings. And that's what we need more in our parks as well. That's what we hear from a lot of parents, especially with younger kids. How do we get more seating opportunities and affordances within that park that they feel comfortable to be around their kids? The other thing um, what I always look at is like when we do a playground, how does it have different play affordances in regards not just physical education, which again gets really much pushed within schools. So how do we make sure that each of the zones is social emotional play? So where the kids can learn from each other, where they have to actually um, learn from different behavior and listen to each other and get this social connectivity. But then obviously the physical components are important, but then also the cognitive ones. So is there spaces where we can engage with the discussion and how can we then make sure that the playground is not just the playground, it becomes a therapy garden. It becomes like in the school environment, a part of the curriculum. So it's about um, storytelling and it's about developing. So it comes back to our three main things to create something that is a wow, so it attracts people, wow, I need to come to this park, to um, take a family park and spend some time there. And then while they're in this park, there's so many things to explore and engage with that they stay for a long time, and then that they can develop so they can challenge and uh, learn new things. And that's why I think this park has zero vandalism as well, because there's so many things where kids can challenging themselves and learn more skills within all these different zones. And from a biophilic design as well, like that all this green space was actually captured. And none of these trees were really like um, taken out. So there's a lot of like um, the, the green lung going through the space as well. That was really inspiring. The other thing what we found in the intergenerational um, park design um, research as well was the importance of a pathway connection. So this pathway is actually part of a million dollar Ipswich citywide connection, but it's 2.2 meters, so it's wider. Um, so it gives a great affordability in regards to, again, what, what you mentioned at, at South Bank for riding, scooter riding, for wheelchair access, for, um, for walking. And then because it's meandering through the landscape, it has all these different pockets where you can sit back, observe, engage in the dog park, engage in the swinging zone, come off and have the spin, come through here, do a bit of sporting and come back. And then there's so many informal, I guess, um, secondary pathway connectivities through all the space, climbing up an embankment, going, down, going up the stairs, going around um, um, the, the accessible pathway, drilling back into the space. So it's, it's really important from, I guess, a personal space theory as well to have this wide pathway where you can keep distance as well, but then also have like little nooks where you can be engaged by yourself or with a friend or even with a bigger group in this area through here. The next one then is like this prospect refuge. So again, if we would have everything in regards to play in one node here, this would be really hard to achieve. So this whole idea of like the meandering river and then you have pockets of play all the way through it is, is, is key for that as well. So for example, here on the top of this nine meter tower, you're up there, you can actually see without being seen, but it's a safe environment up there. So you can be here in the spinner zone where you just by yourself, you actually engage with the zone or with a few people as well, but you are protected through this landscape around it as well. And you can see the part of this. The unit itself has a lot of different nooks as well, where you can be by yourself and be safe, or you can actually be out there and, and, and engage with a broader community. So I think the key thing again with this, like this design was obviously done before this book came out. 
and a lot of these affordances were obviously considered showing you now the overlays of this design. But I think it really helps us now as landscape architects to go back to our clients and say, this is why we did it. This is actually the research that backs it up why it is so important to take um, extra steps early in the community consultation. I think that was so beautiful done here as well. And to stay in contact with the community as well. A lot of times we're doing these things and then we're leaving the site and we don't even know the community, what they love, what they don't love, how they, how we can improve it over time as well. So I think that was fantastic that the Avid Group has this Facebook page and continually um, talks to the community to make sure the space gets used every day to the best possible um, capacity. So here's a couple of images of the actually playground. So here you see this massive view um, tower that is actually blended in. This idea of being in the canopy, overlooking, seeing what's happening down there. But then it has, um, as I mentioned, this massive 80 meter slide, which is quite challenging and not every kid will straight away be brave enough to do it. But then it has smaller um, slides on the second cube here as well and different opportunities to learn to, 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 I guess, uh, meander into this tower all the way through. The fitness equipment, again, beautiful use, how we use the space there, how we use the surfacing to make sure we have different opportunities of engagement within it as well. There's resistance, but also like upper body um, and, and boot camp capabilities as well. And again, the multi-spinner, again, a must for every park because from the proprioception and vestibular stimulation that the spinner actually provides. And that's another thing where the Department of Education needs to look into, because at the moment in their guidelines, there's no spinning and swinging allowed. And that's obviously very important for kids to engage in. So it just wraps it up to show you that. And um, yeah, happy to have some questions and have a bit of a discussion. Hang on, Tobias. Remember, we've got to do a final. We're going to do a final close, and then we we'll do chit chat. Deb's got. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Perfect. We're nearly there, guys. So, I stop sharing, and you share yours again, yeah. Deb. Is that right? I stop. You stop. Yeah, you stop sharing, and Deb shares her screen somehow. And then yeah. we're nearly finished. So yeah, we do want to have a conversation. We just want to make the point really that um, creating great places where people thrive it does does really require some innovation and some boundary pushing and a bit of courageous leadership like i think we know that it's not easy um and there's lots of you know there's always lots of challenges from the site to the community to um the policies and the budget and all of those things but if we can foster best practice and share some kind of innovation to be more creative in how we respond to things. And we really, we really can create great places that are salutogenic. They are health promoting. Um, and I think that's what we all want to do is we all want to make a positive difference in, in the world that we live in. All right, next, Deb. So I guess the real, the question is, are we up for the challenge? Oh, that's a good question. Um, next slide, Deb. I'm going to leave it as a thought. Um, that is here's our book uh we love you obviously we'd love you to buy it read it review it you can get it you can you, we can get you a free copy if you want to review it for a journal so just drop us an email and we can figure out how to do that um and we can email you um uh chapters from the book as well um and we're happy to talk more with people about it and come and run there is my workshop so have, just have a little chit chat uh and i think the very last slide deb just is thank you everybody for coming oh no two lot slides no Ah, thanks for coming for our first one. We've got three more to go. So next week, we're, we're going to do the same thing again next week. We're going to focus on child-friendly design. So Deb's going to lead that and talk about those inter intergenerational playgrounds a little bit more and a few other things that come into mind. So how might we create child-friendly spaces? And then, of course, Tobias is going to give us some examples at the end. The following week, I'm going to talk about age-friendly and inclusive design and what we need to do to create. We're all, we live in an aging world. How can we design a world that's more inclusive? And then finally, we're going to talk about sustainable design and a little bit about biophilic design. And how can we create uh, places that are much more sustainable and regenerative? And um, So there's each week, we're going to talk about a different theme. Um, and uh, use a theory summing process to try and show that uh, it's one way at least to engage with some new fresh thinking and just give us a little bit of structure and guidance. Next. Now we're on the end. Um, yes, questions, bung them through the chat. Um, and yes, there will be a recording that we will send out, we'll put it on Twitter and um, we'll send you a recording as well and we'll put it on LinkedIn. So who's got questions? 
anyone got any questions? Anyone, you're welcome to either put them in the little chat or to um, unmute yourself and talk on the video. Um, if you were to choose a seventh theory to add, what would it be? There's so many good theories. It's a really hard question. I'm going to let Deb answer that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, it's a seventh theory. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Golly. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, that is a really good question. Um, let me think about it. <laughs> yeah, so I'll let you think. Like, we sort of chose, it was hard to choose theories, and we kind of chose what we thought were the most important theories. So we'd love um, people to suggest more theories. Like, they're not the only theories that are out there. In terms of the most important theory, my personal, there's a question here from Tiffany, what's the most important theory? It has to be, for me, actually biophilic design. So engaging with nature and bringing that in. Like, we know that's good for our well-being. But actually, maybe Toby and Deb might have a, have a different view. Well, I think it's it's hard to pick one. I think that's why all oh, the six are so powerful. And I think it's nearly in non And I think that's another thing as well. If we just focus on one, yes, I love biophilic design, but if we just do the biophilic design, or oh, that, that's the whole thing of green street movement. Well, it's still, it's not enough. Like, I think we can't stop here. So that's why the six is, a, is now the new standard. And I think that's a nice thing as well with the discussions we can have with our clients. And I think that's what I find sometimes frustrating working, let's say, with council as well. They know their precincts better than anybody else. So, and then sometimes we get briefs that are so generic, like it's always the same brief. And I think, again, to nearly give them this book, it's like, well, the sense of place is, is like, that's where it all starts. So once we have the sense of place and we know the narrative and we know what we really want to engage with and the community that is part of that, then we can look at the biophilic and then we have to still make sure it's affordances. Like all these things, I think we can't leave one out. It's, I think that's not only what is the most important, they all are the same important and they all need to be system thinking, approaching together to create this beautiful world. I just changed my vote because I forgot about genius loci. So that, that's what's wrong too. <laughs> you go, Deb. No, I, I actually agree. Um, I think probably my first would be genius loci as sort of like we're we're creating too many places that look like or designing too many spaces that look like they could be anywhere. And I think we're losing the value of, you know, all the unique characteristics of, you know, our environment and kind of where we are in the world. And I think that that's detrimental to how we appreciate our environment. Um, but I would say that affordance theory is probably one that I use most often because uh, in design I'm looking at how like it's the activity and, that, and that's just for me and my research. So I think probably affordance theory and, and um, genius loci or sense of place would probably be the, the two. But I would say that place attachment and Yvonne and I actually talked about this when we were writing the book. Place attachment as a theory is a really difficult one to design for because we don't all, even though we have research on why people develop a sense of place attachment, you don't, it doesn't automatically happen. And so, and actually taking into account the attachments that people have to a certain place when you're designing and when you're changing things, if you don't pay attention to that, it actually can be detrimental to how people accept um, the design or the change or you know, what happens. And so it, it's a crucial one. It's just a really difficult one to automatically figure out how to use it. Um, and I yeah. think it's, it's probably more, more the process than the actually design really on that one. Because I think that's, that's what I, I find in, like in Germany, the community consultation was so much different than it is here in Australia. Like a lot of times here we design and then it gets to a vote A or B rather than really getting the community all the way engage with that space and I think then we find that more attachment is there and that we have less vandalism that people actually taking more proud of that space and, and I think that another thing is for me always like um, great places always have this great vibe but the vibe is actually coming from the people so it's like really like how do we get the people there and once there are people there then the vibe comes and that's what attracts more people and then all the other things are sometimes not even so important because Great vibe is not created by the best and most beautiful mosaic tiles. It's about the people that are in that space. So 
Yeah, and um, yeah, that friendly bench came up because, you know, schools have that bench. I've got what it's called. It's an anti-bullying bench. Yeah. It's a lonely seat. What's it called? You can sit on if you're feeling lonely. And sometimes I think we need to have those, okay, cues or affordances that actually, yeah, I am feeling a bit down. I'll happily have a conversation with somebody or, you know, just that kind of build those social networks, particularly in COVID times. Does anyone else want to pop up and just share their thoughts? Please just unmute yourself and get in there. We are just going to have a conversation for the next 15, 20 minutes until the time ends. And if you have to go, that's fine. But please share the words and come back next week. So we talk about child brain design. Okay, there was a question about ah, AR, VR. So augmented reality. Have we thought about augmented reality? I'm sorry, I'm just going to scroll up. There's so much chat. It's hard to see. Oh, here we are. Uh, have you ever investigated how a digital layer might apply, um, i.e. augmented reality? Um, oh, go ahead. No, you go. If you, I've got some thoughts. You go. Um, so actually Tobias and I were, we were on a project actually last year that ran, um, we were working with a local school and, um, looking at gaming and how, um, the creation of an, it was more about environmental education, but it was about how do we use sort of digital devices and sort of a, a game, a augmented reality game or, a, um, yeah. Um, to get kids interested in being out into the environment. So it was sort of using that technology to get kids to s explore nature in a sensory way. So um, we had to stop obviously because COVID and the schools then and research in schools kind of got put on hold, but hopefully we do kind of get to still explore that. But I think it's an important question, um, especially now that um, screen time is becoming more and more uh, well, increased um, and kind of figuring that out and how the digital layer and the physical layer can um, connect a little bit better. Yeah, I think that was, uh, as you said, I, like, the idea with this gamification project was that you can take a photo of a space and nearly like by at Ikea and then you grab different furniture that you rotate around. That was around the seven cents. But again, with this design theories would be actually awesome to do an app around that and then you can actually put it by a phallic layer and try different things so again that's probably where the future is that we can then uh, implement some of these theory thinking into practice again through that could be another thing when you do your next book and also yeah. like a new app you love it no i, I do love it because i think the broader community and the public doesn't don't really understand the process that comes into designing a park or a building or a walkway and don't understand the decision making but imagine if you could actually have an app that said oh this is why we put this tree here not just because of these reasons because of shade and prospect refuge and this is why we did that so it could be a whole educational layer about the design process and the challenges and opportunities and choices i think that's awesome absolutely who's that someone said something who is there no, it might be a baby, even better. Because there's another question about babies. Well, not quite. Uh, Silky has asked, would you think there's a difference in the way children connect with place to have adults experience place? You get that? A difference between how children connect to an experience place versus how adults. So I guess it's a connect. Absolutely. I think it's, um, as Deb said as well, like we as adults, I, I think we are so again, probably like formed in our opinions, as we said, like we look at a chair and it's a chair for a child, it's not a chair, so it can be anything. So I think, uh, again, they're different. And that's, I guess it's important for us as designers as well. Like we have to appreciate if I design a space for the, for the younger kids, well, they're so much smaller as well. So where do we have the visual clues? So we have to merely go on our knees to do the site and needs analysis when we explore the space. And a lot of times I think we are not going to this extra mile of, uh, of design. And I think this is, again, where this book is su such a great reminder for all of us to just come on, let's take a break, have a coffee, and really review, have, have real out for that. And, and again, this um, with, with the head, that's the same thing. So put the head on to be a little child. Put the head on to be a, a person with anxiety issues. Put your head on to be in a wheelchair or in a walker or as a granddad there. Or be, like again, when my kids were so young, was so hard to find a playground where I could be on a fitness thing where my kids were playing. So I had to be with them or then, well, the one kid was already more advanced than the others. So because we design a lot here in silos. So our, our park designs like, here's a little fenced off areas for the toddlers. 
then we walk half a K and then there's something for the teenagers and we walk half a K, there's a water park and then we walk another half a K, there's a fitness. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not integrated. So it's, yes, it's multiple, uh, multi-generational, but it's not intergenerational. I think that's, yeah, the park, when we look at that, yes, there's something for everybody, but they can't do it together and they can't learn from each other. I think that's another thing we are excited over the next three weeks. We talk obviously about that, but I'm coming from Germany. My family is in Germany. My wife's family is in Germany. So my kids don't have a lot of access to elderly people. So there's so much wisdom and, 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 and learning from, from the older generation that it's hard for my kids to experience. So, and again, in parks, we don't allow that to happen. Because it's like all designed this way that an elderly person that is in a park without a child would never go to these areas because it would be, oh, what is um, this granddad doing there? Why is he in the, in the kids? That's a bit odd. And, and I think that's, again, where design needs to be so much better. And, um, and, and we're getting there. But this, again, is, is fantastic help to, to push the cases that we can go beyond what is done at the moment. I just wanted to say something. If I can, Deb, it was good to hear all the theories because I think as designers, we tend to do this without even thinking about all these components. And the strength of this is actually, this is how we can convince our spaces to other parties to get the space done the way we want to create. The, like it's it's selling our space because it it could all be in our head and this is just the way you can sell it. So it's really good and thanks. It's something really positive. Oh, thanks so much. That's a great comment. And I think that's what we, one of the things we really tried to do. And I know Tobias often mentions like the evidence is really what's convincing. And if we have evidence to support some of those design decisions, but the theory was based on a lot of that research. So I think it's sort of, it's all related. So if we have the theory to support sort of yeah. what what is happening and yet we totally recognize that a lot of designers know this stuff they kind of inherently know it or it's sort of um it's kind of part of your practice or you just do it um so we're not discounting that at all it's just that i think nice. some, there's still bad design that's happening right yeah. it's, not, <laughs> it's not like every designer understands this stuff and i think we we really do need to kind of think through more carefully because yeah. space is of a premium and, and money, you know, we spend a lot of money on these places and yeah. to convince a council or whomever to, to do this, I think um, we need that evidence yeah. and backing and it up. It, it'll I be interesting to hear the rest. Mm. And I think that what you said there is, is true as well. Like it's, it's one thing with the designs, but a lot of times, even if the designer has a, has a right intent, if the client doesn't allow it to happen, then we still get poor outcomes. And I think this is, again, so we always said the evidence is so important. We sit with the engineers and they have evidence on everything. And for us as landscape architects, it's like, oh, let's put some trees in. Oh, why? So show me the benefits and how much money it's at. So there's obviously different evidence on that regard. But um, this is yeah, ex exactly the right step in, in, in the right direction. So very exciting. It's just a <laughs> comment from Anna, which is a really good point that um, Queensland Walks would really like this mm. Yeah, because it's a really great way to advocate for walk-friendly streets and green and shaded spaces and all ages play spaces, which is uh, super true. Well, I, Anna, Anna, for that, um, I call a lot of times this like um, connections or, or, or networks, I call them human corridors. And um, because as landscape architect, we design wildlife corridors and we do that really well to make sure that the koala can go from A to B, but a lot of times we don't do it for us humans. So I think it's, it's another thought provocation, like let's design the best human corridors and, and really interconnect all the space that it becomes obviously walkable, cyclable, all these things. And um, absolutely. Anyone else want to pipe in with a question or a video or a thought or, or a controversy or a, you know, a theory that we missed out, which is highly likely. Um, and I, maybe we could talk. So Deb and I are doing this. Yeah, this, we're doing this next book uh, about redesigning the unremarkable. So we really would love you to keep your eyes open uh, and photograph unremarkable spaces and places and products and just things out and about. Hang on. Where are we? There's a question about AR. It could be you. Oh, no, it's a comment. Uh, could be used for under oh that's a really good comment uh it could be used for understanding the users understanding their affordances before the design is finalized especially for children 
Um, that's actually a really great idea that you could actually test affordances. And then another another comment or thought, do you guys want to comment on either of those? The second one is about the legacy of maintenance, also a challenge. But I just wanted to say one thing as well, like um, for one, as we said, it's great to, to use the theories now to explain to our clients. But I think the next step is then, and I think that's again where the design industry is not doing it to the full extent. How do we actually explain what we have done to the general public? And again, then this is a fantastic thing where we can actually use some of these things. And then let's say we work with the Avid group and we say, hey, we make you little booklets that explain this and you send that out to every single resident. How amazing is that? So as a resident, you go, like, wow, I'm living in this environment now. They actually did this park and they considered all of that. So it just actually builds in the general public the, 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 the thought that went into this design as well and how they actually can utilize it as well. Sometimes it just needs this this little step for a purse, for example, if I'm, I'm a dad of a kid with autism and then there's actually, I get a letter and it says like this park is designed with Joey in mind that has autism and there are spaces for him where we know he, he will feel comfortable. I'm like, oh, thank God, finally somebody thought of my child as well and not said here's a new inclusive playground and I go there and Joey absolutely hates it because it only has a ramp or, um, or a liberty swing, but nobody even thought of Joey. So I think this is the stuff where we can actually use now, put it together, and not only share between our peers and with our clients, but also with the general public. So I think that would be, and then they will request these things, and then we have really people power making the change because they all wanted that. Yeah, and just going to um, some of the comments on um, getting uh, like children's perceptions of the affordance. I think that's a, a really important and, and great idea and using different technologies to do so. I think especially because some affordances are learned or some some cues are actually learned so they're not not um, automatic. Um, and I think kind of knowing that. So one of the things I used to talk about with the class I taught was um, if we can get away with using no signage, that would be ideal. We can't, <laughs> and that's okay. But the fact is, um, you know, if we can, if we can actually look at something and understand what to do with it and what opportunities there are, then that's it means it's been designed pretty well. Um, but it's interesting to see how kids to observe how they use a space. And one of the things I like to do is when you travel to a foreign country, especially especially with a completely different culture. And as an adult, you actually have to learn how you do things and what's the norm. And because there's all these social norms and things about how we've designed our space that are very um, different depending on where you are. And I think that's a good reminder for us that it's actually not always clear what, how we use a space or what opportunities there are. And I think if we can do research and we can include more people in, um, designing spaces actually at the front end to understand how they they perceive that space. I think that that would definitely add benefit to how we design and what we know about people using spaces. Or Barbara? Or, or was it accidental? You know, we've got like, I don't know, four minutes. Has anyone got a question or a thought? Toby, Deb, anything that's in your head that you want to share? No, oh, I'm just super excited. I think that's fantastic. Can't wait for next week to have further discussions. Yeah, so what it will be a little bit different next week. So we'll talk more about child to next week's child friendly designs. So we'll talk more about why that's important and and you know, a little bit more of the background and some studies and things like that. And then we'll do some very slow on that. And then the following week it's age friendly inclusive design and the same kind of thing, a bit more background on the on this global priority and why it's important. Uh, do you and um, I'll just say that um, whoever asked the question about the, if there was another theory, I'll have an answer for you next week. <laughs> so definitely come back. I'm just, my mind is just swimming with <laughs> this week's presentation. So um, yeah. I'll I know we, we did talk about other theories, dear, but I can't think of any either. I'm just gonna blame COVID brain. Like there's I know. <laughs> trees going on. There's only so much cognitively you've got available, which is why we need to be in trees and nature, right? So we've got like three minutes. Um, we'll just wrap up. Shall we wrap up and say bye? Thank you, everyone. See you 1.30 next week. Please spread the word. Uh, we're on Twitter and LinkedIn. And um, yeah, we're totally keen to catch up offline as well. So that's a, a thing, right? We do want to literally just have conversations and drink coffee and theory storm over some coffee. Yes. <laughs> or Project Storm. 
Awesome. See you guys. Thank you, you everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Great, great presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I'm so excited that you've used Salagenics. <laughs> oh. That's great. Yeah. I'm glad to I, hear other people know about it. Exactly. And I um, absolutely love the challenge that you're throwing down that um, we should perhaps look at research methodologies that adopt multiple theorems rather than just a single focus. So I, I think that's, that is wonderful and it's great to hear. So um, ladies after my own heart. So well done. Great to, great to be involved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, we kind of just sort of made it up right, dear. One afternoon. Theory storming. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we hope it's fun. We find it fun. So I hope other people find it fun and helpful. We'll see. Yeah, Thanks. well, I have a bit of the same approach. So, um, but my work's in aging. So I find the same, same thing applies. So really excited. Tracy, my research isn't aging a bit. Tell me, what are you doing in aging? Uh, um, my, um, my, my thesis research was um, around, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with the UBRC model of um, university-based retirement communities and the whole idea of health models built around active aging um, and the importance of that, um, of, of potentially oh adjusting um, some of our learning environments to incorporate aging and, and stuff. So working with Bruce Judd and yeah. a few others down in UNSW at the time. Yeah, great. Yeah. That sounds really cool. We are talking about aging. I think it's week three. Uh, yeah. It's more about inclusive design and age-friendly design. And um, so try and catch that if you can. Yeah, um, no, definitely. But yeah. thank you. We really enjoyed it. Oh, good. Uh, Yay. Thanks. Made a Tuesday. It's a weird, it's a weird day of the week to have it. But anyhow, we're going with it. Thanks. Thanks again. It was really interesting. And I'm just eavesdropping listening to the conversations. But um, it's really good to see like that aged inclusive play and I would love to one day be doing a playground that is actually next to an age care center or something that is like that connection within the two two would go really well for health and well-being for all parties and I think I've seen a video where they showed the children forces the older generation to do things that they they wouldn't un, wouldn't do if there wasn't that push so that that whole using the two generations to help each other sort of thing. So, no, think, um, that is increasingly the push. Actually, I'm on yeah. a project, the National Health and Medical Research Council project, where we are. It's called Grand Schools, and we're looking at co-locating oh, nice. retirement with high schools. So we're, wow. we're increasingly talking about childcare being co-located with aged care, which is a positive. Yeah, yeah. With having the high schools, it's actually about co-learning and um and sort of so co-teaching. So yeah. if you're in a retirement village. Often you'll have a lot of knowledge to share, so you might be able to be a mentor for a small yeah. business. Or, and then we've got the high school kids. Some of them might want to learn how to be, you know, work in, you know, as a carer, yeah. or they might want to do a social enterprise together. So similar. So there's lots of really innovative uh, um, models. Be interesting to be involved. I, I wouldn't even know how to get involved, so I would yeah. love to sort of I'll, keep. I'll put, I'll put sort of, on here. I'm going to put the link. I think unless anybody else has any comments or questions for us. No. no. Keep up the good work. I'll, I'll <laughs> look forward to hearing next time. Yes. <laughs> yes. Bye. Bye. Tuesday. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Bye. Bye.